Hi everyone. Hope you can all hear me okay. I'm uh, in a storage room <laughs> with a refrigerator in the background, so hopefully you can hear me okay. Um, so welcome to the Facebook Live. I'm just gonna pull up some of the questions that were asked. Um, if anybody just wants to signal that they can hear me, that would be great, just so I know I'm doing the right thing. Okay, good, great. Okay, so, um, so this is kind of a follow-up from what we did in November where I was talking about overcoming resentment in marriage. And um, several people in the group asked about how do you overcome the feelings of resentment that you might have about ways that you felt you were inducted into false ideas, either through church culture or family culture that really limited your life shaped your choices, but perhaps in ways that are hard to support or feel good about now. And so um, these aren't easy topics, and I'm gonna be trying to give you some of my best thoughts about how to think about what's, uh, how you overcome this, how you forgive life for being a, a deeply flawed experience, which is no small task, right? Learning how to handle our disappointments without them undoing us is, is a real, uh, important and meaningful challenge. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna read just a couple questions that came in on the topic of overcoming resentments towards church culture. And then um, I have a couple more questions that um, have to do with resentment in marriage. So we'll kind of just see how we do for time. Um, so this person writes, um, I've been married, I got married at 19 and had my first child at 20. Definitely the result of church messaging now I have an empty nest and I feel so resentful. I loved raising my kids, but I feel like I traded that for a career or personal opportunities. I feel like the church promises endless happiness if you follow the plan, but I feel like I gave it my all and then got dropped off the side of the road. Another person writes, this, that was a woman who wrote that one. This is from a man. He says, I've been struggling with how I feel about the church. I've been dealing with wounds I have and trying not to lash out at the church. I don't know if I'm just looking for something to blame, but I can't help but think that my pain was caused by the church. I feel myself distancing from it. I cringe when my parents call. I don't want to talk to them about anything. They represent the church to me. I struggle to want to participate in my callings. I stopped wearing my garments because they represent all the terrible messages about sexuality. Right now, I've never felt closer to God but I've never felt farther from the church. I'm scared to even start confronting my feelings. My relationship with my wife is better than it's ever been. I regret how long it's taken us to get where we are, and I can't help but blame the church culture as the major limiting factor. So my question is, how do I move forward and find a place in a church that I feel has hurt me so much? How can I forgive my parents? I know they did the best they could, but it still hurts. So, you know, these are not easy questions. And um, let me just give you a few of my thoughts about them. And then I really would love to hear some of your thoughts or, or follow up questions. But the first thing, <coughs> excuse me, the first thing I would say is that these feelings and experiences are real and they're legitimate. And I think it's really painful to feel like you trusted in an idea um, that worked against you ultimately and you know I know a lot of good people who feel this way and for example I know some good women who feel like they were taught for example not to pursue a degree or career and maybe even trusted in that against their own desires or their own wishes and now find themselves stuck and, and in trusting in that now find themselves stuck or economically dependent right and that it's too challenging now to go back, or even if they do go back to school, it's not the same as the opportunities perhaps that they gave up for trusting in that ideal. And so, you know, that's hard. That's really hard because it's one thing just to follow an idea that leads you in the wrong direction, because I think that happens to all of us. There's lots of ideas out there and some of them pan out and others don't. I, I think it's another challenge when you go against your own inclinations because you're being sort of taught to trust other people's ideas about what you should do and be. 
and that if you're a good person, you will trust in it or you will sort of suppress your own thinking around it. And, um, and so if you're being taught like this is the true way you should not listen to yourself and then you do that, then to have, to become disillusioned with that source is especially painful because you feel duped or you feel misled um, or you feel like your trust or trusting inclination was exploited. And so, so you know, it's, it's not easy. And, um, you know, that's a big part of our, our church culture is the idea that we've got the answers. Now, we do have a lot of answers, okay? We do get a lot of things right. Okay, there's a lot of core principles that are profoundly valuable and important, but we can overextend what we're confident about, what we've gotten worked out, and use it to pressure validation from people within the group, pressure people to conform uh, to certain ideas, and we kind of overplay compliance often. Um, and there's real value, okay, in borrowing wisdom from people who come before us, right? There's, there's real value in it. But we often overplay that to the detriment of our ability to, the other part of our uh, gospel is this idea of coming to your own testimony. Not just, hey, go get confirmation that everything you're being told by others is true. I mean, we do sell it that way a lot. But that you really have access to divine inspiration you really do have access to sort out what you think is true and that we we ought to take that very seriously but in our immaturity collectively we underplay that truth and we and some families are much more dominant in this way that obedience compliance um not questioning not asserting your own thoughts thinking values is really intrinsic in the family culture and so it gets played out a lot more with a lot more costs in my opinion now to grow up in a family where there are no rules and there are no principles and there are no expectations that's its own form of of challenge it's it it's its own limitation um but 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 i think when you have been taught that somehow not listening to yourself is valuable it's really costly in your development. Um, so, okay, so let me just go back to some of my thoughts here so I can not get lost in my detours here. Um, so I think that, um, oh, and then I think another piece is that sometimes when people start to bump up against the fact that the ideas that they've inherited have limited them, are not sufficient, um, have really handicapped their marriage or their sexual relationship or their own development in some important ways, sometimes in the process of trying to speak to that or start to talk about it or to question some of the things that you've learned, you then get treated like you're a threat, that you're a pariah somehow, that you're, you're speaking to things that shouldn't be said because they challenge other people's perspective about what's true or what's right or what's safe. And so that can be especially hard too because is there room for me to talk about what I'm starting to struggle with or what I don't any longer understand? Um, and so the first thing I would just say about this process, and this is what I wish I could say to my younger self because I think my younger self felt in this vacillation, which I think a lot of people do, either I'm screwed up or the church is screwed up. Like, which one is it? <laughs> and, and so you kind of can go between either I'm all wrong or you're all wrong. And so there's this difficulty of, of like, which one, how does this work itself out? And what's happening is as you're starting to kind of sort out your own thinking, you, okay, looks like I'm back. You come right up against the invalidation of the group. Now, what I would say is, if, if I could say something to my younger self, this is normal development. You are in a trajectory of personal development and even moral development that matters. And nothing's gone wrong. Because I would say, first of all, if you really study moral developmental theorists or spiritual development, there is this 
important process of, you know, to kind of put this in really kind of crude terms, you know, when we first start out, the world's really around this idea of where, where will you get punished if you do certain things versus where will you get rewarded? So very kind of egocentric in the moral thinking. But um, as you grow beyond that, right, as you become the age of accountability psychologically, you become more able to access and reference group standards. You become capable of civility. You become more able to reference what, is the, what are the rules of this group. This is very, very important in moral development. It's very important in personal development to become capable of being in a relationship. You have to start to reference outside of how something directly impacts you, which many people as adults have not grown out of, do live in a much more black and white world um, versus being able to move into a collectivistic mindset more where you're, or, or a social mindset where you're more able to reference what are the standards of the group? What make things fair in this group? What make, what are the, rules of engagement. That's what's needed for any democracy or any civil society is that kind of system. And so that's valuable. You need it. And the, you transcend these stages as in you internalize them in, inherently, but then you grow to a higher level and then you internalize that level. A lot of times when people are starting to kind of say, I kind of leaned into the validation inherent to this group, um, but it's limiting me. It's not enough. And so, thank you. That's perfect. And so, um, and a lot of times people can think because this doesn't get the social validation I want, I must be doing something wrong or limited. And rather than I'm growing into deeper personal autonomy than I had in the earlier stage. And if we look at our own theology, where that is in our theology. If you're going to grow to become like God, right? To become godly, to become wise, you need to grow into deeper autonomy in your moral reasoning, into a deeper ability to discern what is right and wrong. I remember that was part of the discussions when I was a missionary is that part of earth life is to learn to discern between right and wrong, uh, between good and evil. And that's a lifelong process. And I think it really is. You know, we can start with very simplistic ideas about right and wrong, very black and white world. Whereas we grow in our reasoning, grow in our maturity, grow in our understanding to take in more of what's real in the world, our sense of what is good versus what is evil grows in its complexity. And we become more able to make sense of the world. Things that seem par paradoxical at one stage you start to see how they are inherently related to one another at a different level of understanding. So this is my way of saying that when you start to look at the limitations within the group, it often feels like you're betraying rather than you're growing or that the group betrayed you rather than you're in a necessary process. Um, and so I'll come back to some of these comments in a minute, but so, that I'm not discrediting though, the way that we can limit each other often by our own limitations within the group. Because it's one thing, you know, I remember my son saying to me once after a primary class when we were driving home from church, he said, mom, do you know that our church is the only true church? You know, like we are the ones who, you know, got all the answers. And, and I just said to him, you know, is that what you learned in primary today? And he said, yes. And I said, well, I think what that means is this is our current best attempt as a group to, to assert what is true, but we are always growing and evolving and you know, we need to be. So it doesn't mean that we've got all the answers, but that we're pursuing what is ultimately true and hopefully we keep growing. Um, I think for him, he was like, whatever mom, you don't get it. <laughs> so, uh, but um, so, um, but, okay, let me just get back to some of these ideas here for one second. Let me just kind of see where I am. Um, yeah, so, so our theology, you know, when, when I look at sort of spiritual developmental frameworks, um, Fowler did one, or moral development, Kohlberg did one, Levinger, there's lots of different um, versions of this, Ken Wilber. There is this ability as you develop to grow into an ever-increasing ability to account for more of humanity 
and more of all living beings and to feel a deeper ability to understand how interconnected we all are. And when you're in a younger state, you're in a much more self-focused or community-focused understanding of morality. And our theology is pushing us out of love, out of love being the drive wheel, the desire to understand, to be known and to know, to seek to live in a Christ-like manner. It's how we live, not the ideas that we have will drive that wisdom forward. Uh, I think what is often the crisis point for people is maybe two things. One is the idea that they were taught that all the answers are here and if you just obey, you're gonna be good, you'll be safe. And we, you know, a lot of us love that idea. I like that idea. I wanted in some ways for that to be the right idea because it's an easier world. I'll just do what everybody tells me is true and. I don't have to kind of step into the complexity and take deeper responsibility. Um, and, you know, in my own wrestling with God, it was clear to me that that wasn't the right idea, that I had to take responsibility and to assert my own self in the world and to do it imperfectly and to learn as I go. But that earnest pursuit of what is really true is a refining process. It's what creates strength and moral clarity within you, but it's more exposed and it's harder. So I think what a lot of times we feel is the anger that, hey, I was given this idea, I trusted it, and it's not been working out for me, and there's been real cost. And I think there's maybe, I don't know, three antidotes to that maybe, if I'm just gonna think out loud here for a second. I think one of them is to say, you know, the people that have been teaching me these ideas are themselves in their own moral development. They are themselves in their own position of thinking about what's true and not true. For example, if somebody has grown up in a reality where sex has been dangerous for them, has been exploitative, or somebody, you know, who feels like they themselves have no real control over their sexual impulses because of where they are in their development, they are very likely to teach a framing of sexuality that promotes that idea because it fits with what they understand to be true. Sex is scary, stay as far away from it as you can. And um, you know, even though the child can track that the parent has an ambivalent relationship to sex or doesn't always just stay away from it and can even be indulgent with it. And so you, it's, you can't really offer a framing that you don't yet know to a large degree. You have to kind of understand it to be able to encourage and bring other people towards it. And so we're often offering to others about where we are. And the, that doesn't mean that we can't evolve as a church community because we have the theology to support much richer, better understandings of God, of truth, of love, of sexuality, of intimacy. I mean, that's uh, of what strength is, of what authority is. You know, I, I think we have it all in our theology, but we tend to go and speak more to the parts that are, I mean, we really tend to do what Christ was critical of, which is we focus on hierarchy and rules and we tend to focus more on the rules for their own sake versus what they're creating or not creating. And so, so one antidote, what did I say was the first one? I can't remember now. Um, oh, it's just kind of forgiving that people are, or just understanding that people are often offering faith at the level at which they operate. And the second thing is to maybe understand this is a developmental process that I'm in and it's, it hurts a little and it's uncomfortable. And um, where some people get stuck is they, they move into a self-righteous rebellion that then facilitates their indulgence in a way rather than deeper responsibility. They can say, well, I was disillusioned. This doesn't all work out the way I wanted. Therefore, I can... I don't have, you know, I've worked with some people who have become disillusioned with church and left, but then are drinking midday on a Wednesday because the church isn't true, you know, that kind of thing. And it's like, wait, 
you still have responsibilities to your family, to your wife, to yourself, to your job. You can't use your unhappiness with something to justify, to get yourself out of the inherent morality of living life and what impact you have on other people. And so that's a tempting place for people to get out of the pressure of taking deeper responsibility for their lives. And I think another antidote is understanding how was I, well, and I don't mean to say, you know, when you're a child, you, you don't really have the ability to think through and make a different decision than what you're being given. But how was I complicit in the systems or realities that have worked against me? You know, for example, some people feel angry that, you know, I was working with a couple recently where she was feeling upset. I'll just use this metaphor. Like I, I hooked my cart to your horse and, and I resent that I've been following you around for years. And, um, you know, to his credit, he was trying to be the best horse he could be and she was trying to be the best cart she could be. Okay, but there's inherent limitations in that. And they think they both were unhappy and had a lot of resentment with each other. But it's easy to say, you're the stupid horse, you got it better than me. And I'm not sure that that's entirely true, actually. I'm not sure, I don't know which role in that I prefer because they're both limited. And so in some ways, can I see like, how did it serve me? I mean, she was saying it did serve me to follow because I had some fantasy that somebody else was going to kind of forge the way, keep me safe, give me a purpose. And I didn't have to tolerate the anxiety in doing that. So I was complicit in a role or in a dependency that felt I could, I could hide in it, that it felt safer to me. And so, um, sorry, I know you're making lots of good comments, everybody. I'm just gonna see what it's saying. Um, sorry, uh, Amanda says, I feel like my struggle was in the belief that God and the church were one and the same, and somehow all these humans had authority that I needed to defer to because they spoke for God. That left no room for me to be a good person if I felt something said by an authority wasn't right. Yeah, sovereignty is the word I use for this antidote. Yeah, I agree with both of those things. Yeah, exactly. And so, you know, and again, family culture can really make a difference. I, you know, I very fortunately grew up in a family. My father was a little bit, my father tended towards libertarian ideals in his politics and was not, there was room in the family to not think in uh, orthodox ways. There just, there just wasn't any pushback for it. There was kind of room to have the thoughts you had or to think about the things you had thought about. And so even though I certainly understood the ideal, because I definitely had this as a, I remember as a missionary, just feeling like, what is the matter with me? Why does everybody get it? Everybody's confident about everything. And I'm like something fundamentally broken about me because it feels much more complex to me than this. And so I saw it as a curse, not a blessing. And I saw it as, you know, something that was underdeveloped in me because it seemed to me that smarter and more righteous people were fine with it. <laughs> so I'm like, all right, like I clearly have plenty of work to do. But I think that that, you know, pushed me to struggle more in my relationship with God. Like, what is truth? And what is expected of me? Who am I supposed to be in all these questions? What is, do you want me to just close my eyes and just do what everybody tells me? Is that what will yield goodness? Or do I need to approach this honestly, but humbly? And I, I don't, I've maybe told the story before and I won't get into it now, but after a lot of struggle over a long period of time, that's really the answer that I got, which was that this is a struggle that's meaningful and important. So, um, okay, I'm losing my antidotes here. I think I said a few of them. So uh, recognizing sometimes our own role in, in kind of yielding to something or going against something in ourselves, oftentimes it feels safer. We don't have to deal with the social invalidation of it. Seeing it as normal, forgiving people for being where they are in their own development. And I think another antidote is, I think that a lot of times our resentments come because we sort of believe that I, the idea that life should be free of suffering. That if things were going the right way, 
we would not be going through this difficulty, we wouldn't have to suffer losses, we wouldn't have to uh, metabolize grief and pain and frustration. And I think that even that process is a process that is refining. And, and I know that that sounds a little cliche. I don't mean it in a cliche way. I really mean it in a very real way that, that to kind of be up against how disappointing life can be in the sense, I mean, I don't mean to say it like, just that life is hard. Life has a lot of suffering in it. And so any fantasy we have that we're going to be handed an easy life is really a fantasy that we all like. We all want that idea, but it really isn't the truth about life. And recognizing that opens us up to both gratitude for the good things that we have, how things could be much harder or much worse. And also, who are we going to be in the face of a world that is hurting and a world that needs strength and needs love? You know, to be resentful about the love you don't get or the wisdom you don't get or the is... I, honestly, I make room for some of it. I, I understand that we're going to have feelings and that's okay. But to build our life on that resentment is much more dangerous rather than what can I learn from this? I am disappointed. It does hurt. I feel disillusioned. What can I learn about human beings, about humanity, about myself in looking at this? What's my responsibility in it? What do I choose going forward in the face of what I'm learning? And those are the questions that help us move forward. Um, those are the kinds of questions that help us bring our courage into a world that needs it desperately. Um, I have maybe a couple more thoughts, but uh, just that you know, I think my own process of, of discerning what is true and not true and kind of daring to kind of tolerate where I stand, even if it's limited. I can remember once working with Dr. Schnarch in a practicum setting where I was presenting a case and I was role playing being the therapist. And I remember I, I oh, we can't remember, maybe it was in the write up, but I was basically saying, I can't tell if this is the truth about this couple or if this is the truth about this couple. And I, I was just vacillating between these two positions and never taking a position. And I remember him saying, the only way you're gonna know what's right about this couple is to take a position, claim a position and go with that position. Because if it's true, it will reveal itself to you. And if it's not true, it will reveal itself to you. What, what you're not seeing will become exposed if you're in the wrong position. And if you're in a good position, that will also reveal itself. And that was a very helpful idea because what it means is in order to keep progressing in our wisdom, we have to tolerate making imperfect choices with imperfect information. As long as we say, stay, stay humble and open to learning from it and tolerating our imperfection in it and the imperfection of others in it. And I think that this teaches us a lot about God. It teaches us a lot about what's true, but it's, it's a rather harrowing process a lot of the time to be confronted with your own blind spots, your own limitations, how your own fallibility has created difficulties in your life how the fallibility of others has created difficulties in your life and how to not let that destroy you or undermine you or turn you into somebody who is just resentful and bitter, but somebody who metabolizes those losses and uses them to grow into strength and love and courage. That's what real faith is. That's the best understanding of faith I have is that you keep believing in the fact that truth will set you free, even though it always hurts, like it's always hurt, but it hurts often in that process of coming to see it and to know it. And so, and what's interesting, I have one more thought and then I'll see if there's comments here to look at, but 
I think that um, one of the things I've seen in myself as the as I've given myself freedom to think what I think or believe what I believe and not like this is my belief and I don't care what anybody thinks, but like this is really where I stand. It may be wrong, but this is what I think. Um, that just staying open, then life continues to teach you. And it's kind of interesting because there are ideas that I rejected as a younger person that I learned at church, that as I get older, I understand them in a different way and they are true again in a different way. So for example, when I was younger, this idea of self-sacrifice, particularly for women, was an idea that I saw working against me and many other women. Um, that you know you should just be happy doing what the husband wants you just take his name have his kids clean his house you know the worst version of that that the upside is you get to belong to somebody you have position within society you're married within you know our church culture society and there's obviously a lot of limitations in that understanding, just as there are in the reciprocal position, which is if you're a good man, you're gonna take care of somebody and be the strong one and be the one who leads her and, you know, is kind of pretend strong while she's sort of pre pretend dependent. And um, so I didn't like those ideas and I had a lot of issue with them. And part of the things I was struggling with, you know, in the MTC was just the kind of, um, how to say it, this kind of divine sanction supposedly for a really limited role for women. And um, one that I thought was dangerous for me at least, if not others. So, but as I've gotten older and I've really been able to establish a stronger sense of self and to be in a partnership where I feel like a real, where I am a real equal and there's a real uh, collaborative alliance between me and my spouse uh, that what's also as I been true for me or come to be clear for me is how much self-sacrifice is fundamental to goodness <laughs> and but I don't I don't mean to say I didn't get it then and I should have but you can't really get it until you start to have a self to really give to have um, a clarity about who you are from which to really share your strength or your capacity in the world. And that there's something about that that accrues to you in a way that like this, that it's fundamental to living a good life. And so I think there's a lot of things like that, that but, but that process is important and to trust that process and to, as long as you're in pursuit, in the most honest pursuit of what you believe is good and you're willing to stand honestly by those positions and not use them to you know, rebel or self-serve or anything like that. Well, the world needs more of honest pursuit of truth. The world needs people that honestly take up their responsibilities, even if they do them, even though they will do them in a flawed way and imperfect, you know, and, and continues to learn through that. That's what increases people's ability to find deeper joy, deeper freedom, and, you know, a deeper ability to serve and give within the community that sometimes disappoints them or in relationships that sometimes disappoint them. So let me just see what thoughts some of you have before I just touch on some of the other questions this person says um, how do we avoid falling back into deference when interacting with childhood relationships for instance yeah well it's easy to do that for sure especially you know I bet if I went back to a high school reunion I'd be like uh, you know like I would. <laughs> I'm sure it'd be very easy to fall back into the role or how I saw myself then or maybe how I think other people might have seen me but I think the more, it's just a process. You know, I used to sometimes think when I was, you know, when I was trying to work through some of these places where I'd go into a one down position and then I would really think through them and I think when I'm with this person that makes me feel inferior or that I easily feel inferior with, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hold on to my own sense of self when I'm there and I'm gonna, you know, be kind to myself. 
And then I would get with that person and I would immediately fall back into my limitations. I'm getting worried about my phone losing its charge. But anyway, so, um, but it's a process. And if you keep going, the more you solidify into your own sense of what's true and you're less concerned about, you know, when I was um, going, when I was writing my dissertation, I was seeing a therapist that was really helpful to me because I was in the process of writing it feeling disillusionment, feeling frustration about some of the teachings that I thought were limiting to me and others and trying to sort out what I wanted and then going to church and feeling angry about the validation I couldn't get from other people around my concerns about some of it. And then I'd try to bring it up and people of course didn't want to hear about it and and then I'd feel more self-righteous and indignant and <laughs> I'm sure annoying um, and you know, and I remember complaining to my therapist about all the things that people wanted from me, the way they wanted me to think or the way they wanted me to see things. And, you know, that I felt pressure that I had to be at church, even though I felt sometimes claustrophobic there. And I remember her saying, I keep hearing about what everybody else wants from you, but what do you want around this? Who do you want to be here? What do you want your relationship to the church to be? How do you, and, and I was like, no, those questions, I don't like those questions. <laughs> Let's stick with victim. <laughs> Let's stick with how unfair it is that people don't appreciate where I'm struggling. So, um, but, but those are the right questions is, you know, for me to grow up enough to think and take deeper responsibility for who am I going to be in this world in the face of the limitations I see and what do I desire for myself around my spirituality and my growth and my relationship to the church? That's, that's owning it is really, really important in moral development and scary to do and easy to get away from and, and find others to blame instead. Um, it, all I can see is, was the one thing most feared, the one thing that I pled with God to never let me have to go through I haven't asked for much in life, but a loving marriage was the one thing I really, really, really wanted, even if I failed at everything else. I'm living my own worst nightmare every day. For as long as I can remember, I really believe that divorce was a suffering worse than death. I still feel that's true. Yeah, I'm, divorce is a very hard thing. And betrayal and disillusionment, and it, it's extremely hard. I think it's extremely hard to say I was doing the best that I could and either it still wasn't enough and it's cost me or that other people, you know, took advantage of my trust or took advantage of me or, and to face that and to tolerate it is not easy. I mean, it just isn't easy. And I think that the most helpful thing is to trust that that learning from it will help you find more solid ground and I, I know it's cold comfort I'm not offering a Pollyanna view of what it is to live but truth is solid ground what is true about my role in this what is true about my spouse's role in this what is it that I have to grow up in me to create the one thing I really 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 wanted what is it that I need to keep addressing in me, knowing that I don't have perfect control? You could do all the right things and still be betrayed or still have somebody who doesn't want to love you back. So we don't have control over more than who we are. Um, but it still matters. I mean, I think that, you know, one of the things that I will tend to cry about <laughs> is watching people in the face of suffering do what is good. Watching people bring love to a really horrifying situation. I remember going with my son a few years ago to New York City to see, um, I can't remember what they call the World, World Trade One. I can't remember what they call it now, but the, the, the World Trade Centers that were replaced there. And I just, 
remember walking around the memorial and seeing the names of each person who died and seeing different individual flowers stuck in the names of the people whose birthdays it was. It was snowing when we were out there looking at it in a kind of gentle, beautiful way. And I just couldn't stop crying. I couldn't stop crying because of how much people wanted to take all that was dark and hurtful and turn it into something good, to salvage what is good. Watching people be honest when it is at their own expense, meaning when it's they're doing the right thing, even though it may cost them. That gives me hope and courage. Even if they do it in a way that others disagree with and disagree with credibly, right? That they are still trying to stand up for what is right and true and will be good for the, the whole. Um, that takes courage to sacrifice ego for the benefit of all. And so I think it's valuable to see that that is true in the world when, when we're confronted with so much disillusionment or hatred or hostility. Um, so, you know, the, the question of, let me just answer one more thought here before I move on to the other question, but you know, this question of, I, I don't know how to ever trust anyone again, least of all God in the church. I think what it has to do with is learning to trust yourself more deeply, to be more able. Um, I, I think that it comes to trusting your own ability to measure what is true and what is good, to getting more able, because if you have a blind faith, you shouldn't lean back into that kind of trust. If you've trusted for the sake of it or without sort of being wise. So belief in and of itself are not, is not inherently a virtue. Trust isn't inherently a virtue, but a grounded trust is, a grounded faith is. Um, faith in what is true, faith in the reality of love, those things, well, I'll tell you, you deserve to trust that that's true, but discerning what it is takes time and earnestness and perseverance and hope and, um, Sometimes we have to dig through a lot more darkness to find our way to it or to feel that it's real. And especially people who've come through really, really difficult things. So I don't stand in any simple judgment of someone who despairs or has a hard time trusting or believing in the reality of goodness. But, um, but thankfully it is there do this and then I'll go on to the next question. Can you give some practical ideas on how to move forward? Like how to re-engage with my parents and not hold my own space when and not just fold back into their expectations? Yeah, well, you know, I would say that it, it means being more willing to be knowable and tolerating the intimacy of it. You know, I think it's easier to resent the validation you don't get than it is to say, this is what I really think. This is where I am currently in my thinking. And I don't demand that you see it the same way or feel the same th things about it. Um, a lot of times what we try to do is, yeah, so it's being more willing to be knowable and to say what we think and feel and not to convince or make someone see things the same way you do. I know that I would do that at first. I'd be trying to prove to people, you know, whatever I thought, as opposed to a more honest um, position of, this is where I am. This doesn't work for me, or this doesn't fit for me, and this is why. And, and so I think that um, it's more a practice of showing who you are than trying to, I think, it, it, what do you do if you're disillusioned with God? And I would say it's good to become disillusioned with God <laughs> uh, because I think we're all honoring, we are all worshiping a false God on some level. And, you know, as you grow in your wisdom and understanding, hopefully your view of who God is evolves also. And so you may have had faith in a God that isn't real, a God that would give you, if you checked all the boxes, then you'd get the 
vending machine of rewards. And that's an important God to become disillusioned with, if that makes sense. What I think is harder is maybe trusting in a reality in which good is real or love is real. And that's, you know, it can be easy to become cynical and um, not keep trying. So, says Jennifer, thank you for doing these love sessions. Your approach and your words, thoughts are so enlightening and helpful. Thank you, thank you. I'm in a really hard place right now and I'm trying to find myself and understand how I move forward personally. Oops, I just moved one second, sorry. Um, and in my relationships as a husband and father. Yeah, that's great. I'm, I'm actually working on a book right now with a BYU professor on sexuality and spirituality. And we're not covering all these themes, of course, but um, what we're taking up is sort of uh, the question of how spirituality and sexuality can really be integrated as you, as you grow as a person and grow in your own um, relational development and spiritual development. But the series that we're writing in has a lot of excellent writing that's, that there's releasing a book at a time. And so it's, it's the Faith Matters um, publisher and they've released the first two books. One of them is Terrell and Fiona Gibbons book. It's called All Things, oh, this is bad. I can't remember suddenly. All Things Something. Um, and then Patrick Mason did the second book. I know, um, I know, um, sorry, I can't remember. <laughs> anyway, I know the next one that's coming out is Sam Brown, and he's writing about uh, another aspect of faith. But these are really, I think, beautiful visions of kind of what our theology offers to us as possibilities and ways that we can grow and still claim our faith in more um, expansive ways and ways that help us come to know God in richer ways. So, I mean, these are obviously not the final conversation or anything, but they are at least an honest and earnest attempt to offer um, some thinking on these topics. Um, let me just grab my computer. So this person writes, though he has grown and changed a lot, for much of our marriage, especially in the early years, my husband was really awful about his reactions. If he didn't feel he was getting enough attention sexually, he once told me, we are never visiting your mother again unless you promise to have sex with me every day. Right, not a good move. <laughs> uh, he's much better in the last several years, but I have a hard time letting go of the resentment that built up over 25 years. How do I get past it? So I would just quickly give a few answers to that. I mean. I think here's some forgiving agents, if you want to say it that way, some, some things that are the antidote to that resentment is, well, so there's, there's forgiving is one thing, as we talked about a few sessions ago, as opposed to trusting. Those are two different things. Forgiving is not living in resentment and hostility, but trusting someone is dependent on them becoming trustworthy or growing into a different and better position. So assuming from what you're saying that your husband has grown into a better position, that he has outgrown that old mindset and is a better man and a better husband, then I think it means, you know, how do you forgive that that was a part of the past? Well, I think one idea is tolerating, as we've been talking about today, the inherent process of learning that we're all in, including yourself, that you married someone capable of saying that. <laughs> now, I don't mean to say, you know, you had it coming to you because you were low in your development or something, but more that, you know, that that this was, how to say it, couples co-create so many of these dynamics and they're often a reflection of where both people are, even though they're both, it, it hurts and there's so much more possibility than where the couple's engaging. So in some ways, like forgiving us for coming into this in such a limited way. Like I was talking to a couple recently and they were talking about their family cultures and, and you know, I, I reflected to them, I, I don't know how you could have done otherwise than exactly what you did when you got married. It's exactly what your family set you up to think and feel and believe. 
and you came and recreated it. Now you're finding its limitations and it hurts. And so it's easier to just say, how dare you have thought or believed or done these things as opposed to, I can now see the limitations of the view that I've been in and the way that I've engaged and how it's hurt me and how it's hurt you. And I wanna do better. And so it's just recognizing this is an inherent part of life is that we all learn from wherever we start, from whatever we were given. You know, that, that's where much is given, much is required, but also where less is given, less is required. I don't, I'm not trying to, you know, I, I'm just saying that's what we get. We start with what we have and then we grow from there as hard as that might be. And so forgiving that fact, it's not a small thing, but that's the terms in which we live. Um, I think another thing is if you see your spouse really changing and striving and trying to do better, that's, a very, that's important to recognize. If it's real, I don't mean pretend something's real that isn't, but if it's really true that he understands it, he sees it, he feels regret for it, he's trying to be a better person, well, then there's a lot to acknowledge in that because change is hard. Not falling back into our old patterns is hard. And uh, under, under duress, we will tend to regress to what is most familiar. So to watch a spouse not do that, to self-correct, to ask for forgiveness, to be a better person, is no small thing. And a lot of people underappreciate how good they have it when they have a spouse who will do that. Um, I think the, the last idea about, I have about that is can I let my spouse's limitations go? That is to say, am I going to use my disappointments to kind of punish them forever? It's easy to do that for several reasons. One is that it excuses us from growing up and opening our hearts because we can say, well, yeah, but you still hurt me and let's not forget that, okay? Because it's a way of kind of keeping a one-up position out of a victim frame. And... Um, and also, you know, it, it allows us to not, how to say it, really let the marriage move forward if the spouse is genuinely trying. So you don't have to open your heart back up. You really don't. But I do think it's important to take seriously the question of, am I willing to do that? And can I allow this person to have been who he was and not make him pay for it for life? Or do I not have that into me, in me enough to do it? Because I think it, it, when somebody just doesn't want to forgive and doesn't want to open their heart up, it's better to be honest about that fact uh, rather than keeping somebody looking to finally be forgiven and loved again or trusted again. Um, yeah, I, I see things coming in here. Let me just quickly see. I know we're out of time, but um, I'll come back in and answer some of the things people have, have written. Uh, this person just says, I'd like to know how to respond when a spouse continues to have compulsive behavior after having education and understanding about accepting his sexuality and giving space for him to decide what kind of relationship he wants with sexually explicit material and himself. He says it's not working for him, so I'm not sure why he keeps getting pulled into the compulsive behavior. It's coupled with dishonesty, even though that's the only thing I've asked for. Yeah, I mean, these are... I know we've done a Facebook Live on that topic that maybe Ruby could find and repost um, or draw people's attention to, but we can also take up some of those topics again because, you know, life is this balance between is this person really doing the best they can or are they taking advantage of my trust? And it's not always clear and easy which one it is. Um, is this person really trying and in a human process or do they know that I want this to not fall apart enough that they keep giving themselves a pass. And uh, those are important questions to sort through as honestly as you can to know whether or not trust is wise or engagement remains wise, or if you're having your hope exploited by the person's indulgence in their limitations. So those aren't easy questions to answer without certainly for me to have more understanding of what's going on, but, but that is the question at stake and it has a lot to do. There's again, a distinction between forgiveness and trust 
and they don't go together necessarily, meaning you can trust somebody, you can sort of re-engage with somebody and go blind to who they are uh, while resenting them the whole time. <laughs> you can divorce somebody and forgive them. Um, or you can, you can, you know, forgive somebody and choose them again and trust them because it's a, they are trustworthy. So those are all different, they're different variables. But anyway, thanks everybody uh, for participating. I'll look at a lot of things you wrote and if I'm able to make some comments on that. And I'll see you all next month. Okay, bye everyone.